Maita Basa, thank you so much for joining us for yet another episode of Chat. Today we welcome MM, a talent producer manager all the way from Nigeria. Welcome MM. And today we are going to talk about all things monetization of the creative talent. We met a couple of years ago when we did a conference in South Africa. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we Impact said, Africa they, conference. Yeah, we sat on the same panel and we were talking about cultural intelligence, the role of cultural intelligence mm-hmm. in our settings, what is the use of cultural intelligence. And I just think, you know, we shared a lot of valuable points and we've been following each other since then. And there Absolutely. is no other person I would love to share the stage with right now other than my learned colleague, we are both lawyers. What are the odds? What are I'm the saying, odds? I'm in yeah. great company. Uh, you're welcome, my sister. Please uh, tell our guy a little bit about you and the work you do. Um, well, you, you already stated that um, I'm a lawyer. And thank you for having me. It's always, it's always a great opportunity to you know, rub minds with like minds, rub minds with you. You inspire me in ways that you do not know. I'm a huge fan of what you do. Um, and you have a huge supporter over here in Niger anytime. I, I started out as in the creative industries. Um, both my parents were in the media. So I had like a front row seat to experiencing what, you know, creating content or being in that creative space is. Then my mm-hmm. springboard was um, being a part of a group called Kush. And from then on, I mean, we, we now rested the group realized that there was a lot of opportunities in the Nigerian creative industries there. You had Nollywood booming, you had the music booming. But the one thing we realized was the fact that there was no protection, there was no safety net, there was no direction, you know. So you had a plethora of talent and people who were either producers, record label owners, and the audience was asking for more, but there was no bridge. So we decided Uh to go into representation and um i tell anyone who cares to listen i think the best place to be in in the game is where it happens behind the scenes because representation gives you an opportunity to feel and experience the 360 um, experience of the business so whether it's from ideation to execution to distribution to promotion and um, the likes you have a feel your your finger is on the pulse of whatever is happening so 15, 20 years down the line, look at Nigerian music, you know, blossoming and booming. And that's because serious um, creatives have the right team behind them. And that, that is my story. So I've segued from representation to production. Um, we consult, we do strategic um, consulting for people who want to use um, creative assets or creative properties for their business or to sell goods and services. So yeah. What, what, what kind of involved in the entire ecosystem of the creative industry? That is amazing. So you then, from what I'm understanding, is you're an entertainment lawyer, right? Well, I do a bit of that, but I'm also um, a manager. Um, I manage some phenomenal, uh-huh. or our company manages phenomenal talent like uh, Peter Okoye, you know, P-Square. Um, huh? Bikia Graham Douglas, Muiwa um, of River Songs and Premier FM Fame, Konle Remy, um, Rico Suave, a Bounce. The, the list is endless. We, we, we are privileged to represent some of the finest talent on the continent. Look at you, sis. Look at you, sis. You know, play, when, you, when you say P squared, I'm not, I, it's like you, you're just so casually saying this. And then I was looking at the picture of um on your on your whatsapp you know you have a picture of inside of a jet Uh-oh. and i think that's one of my things on my bucket <laughs> is, is to get into a jet and this child we, has I, pictures in jets i'm like what? i don't believe you we, we have to come I'm to zim and do one or two trips <laughs> i am pursuing the wrong law i need to go into entertainment <laughs> it's, I, it's I, the I, um it's not the perks of the job where you have to do, when you have to be an octopus and be in several places at the same time, yeah. you, you, you kind of have such inconveniences. Look, what a lot of the work that you do talks into monetizing of the creative talent. Um, mm-hmm. Walk through what that really means. I mean, I shared a clip 
on um, on my page just last week, mm -hmm. and on the clip, mm -hmm. you were talking about mm -hmm. people are so quick to want to grow up, mm -hmm. right? They don't understand that growing up is the easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. What is harder Absolutely. is to stay on top. Can you yeah. just walk me through that uh, statement? Um, I think, you know, everybody wants to be successful. You know, um, people hardly have any knowledge as to how to get there. They don't know the processes that people have to go through. When you sit with people like you, myself, uh, Peter, or a Bikia, and you think, oh, maybe because people are from certain backgrounds, they had it easy. Or when Peter tells you his story about how, you know, they hustle to get on talent shows, him and his brother, to becoming the biggest um, duo in Africa, you think it's an easy process. You think it happened overnight, but it's not quite like that. You have to put in work. You have to exercise your stamina, your ability to take a lot of no's and hard knocks and doors closed in your faces and still say, I'm going to keep at it. So it takes a lot of commitment and dedication and sacrifice. A lot of people don't see that. They don't understand that. So when they finally get into that space, yeah. they think, well, I'm here already. This has been my goal. But what do you do yeah. to maintain and sustain that level of success? So when you see people, you know, with 10 years in the industry and still being top five or top 10, you need to duck your hats because it's one of the hardest things to do because you cross a milestone and say, okay, I've gotten here. The next question you start, you start asking yourself is, what next? What's, what's next for me? Because you haven't, the average person hasn't thought about beyond this success or what you define or you determine as success for yourself uh, what am i doing yeah. next I hope that yeah that, that's that's very you know i had maybe for me, the advantage of this whole week i had the advantage to i had time to actually think about that statement and i thought you know when you are working so hard towards a goal right mm -hmm. if you take mm -hmm. short and, and that's the thing about a lot of create uh, a lot of business in the creative sector a lot mm -hmm. of people want it gratification right oh, yeah. they don't put in the five years six years seven years um mm -hmm. and eventually when you become that one hit wonder um mm. you are in this space where you actually don't understand and that's usually coupled with a lot of depression anxiety exactly exactly yeah exactly. so when, when i imagine taking your time is important in, in these Absolutely. processes yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you do have to take your time. Again, what are your long-term or your short-term or your mid-term goals? You need to treat your talent or your craft like a business. You know, mm. and mm. The, the one thing, the one thing mm. that this pandemic has taught a lot of entertainers, hands down, at least 85% of them, is what's your plan B? I wanted to pause it and really think about that point. People mm -hmm. need to think of their plan B, right? It's like mm -hmm. you've got one mm -hmm. income stream. Who yeah. has one income stream? I want to know if Beyonce has one income stream. I want to know we if... We both know uh, she doesn't. P Squared has one income stream. Yeah. So one of the things that we look out for and we tell our talent is we know that you're great at one thing. There's something that is your anchor talent, but there's got to be more to it. So if yeah. Bikia Graham Douglas, everyone know, would know that she's an art aficionado in the sense that she curates arts. She's a great, you know, theater um, facilitator. She writes um, and she's a good producer as well. So there's got to be more than one thing that you're great at. You have to have more than one revenue stream. And what this COVID situation has taught a lot of us is the fact that you go away from instant gratification and just one stream of income to several so right now a lot of entertainers are sitting at home there are no live events to go to so what do you what do you do you have to be innovative should i have you know a, a, an intimate concert in my home and still give people you know the chance to enjoy my music or should i collaborate with other people um maybe i should re-release one or two songs or an album and ensure that you know i'm making income from streaming and digital platforms. So this period has got people thinking and has been more real for a lot of people than most that, listen, you're not going to keep dwelling on income from live events, especially for artists in Nigeria, mm. especially for actors. So this thing that we're doing, we're creating content. So a lot of people have found 
new skills and new talents from creating content. TikTok, you got, you know, <laughs> Kole Remy is the king of TikTok in Nigeria, and it's, it's, it's a totally it's different ball game. It's driving but you gotta, crazy. It's, it but it's entertaining, right? I'm going to lose my mind. So, I mean, so we, we have to look for ways of monetizing this new normal in terms of content, in terms of the way people, you know, digest or assimilate content. Um, there, there are various ways to, to do that. So if you and I are putting a video together, a five-minute video, people are consuming news, information, and content like never before. It's unprecedented, you know. So what creative people should be doing at this point in time is saying, what's the unique experience that I can offer my, my audience? And once you find what that is and ensure that no one else or there are very few people that can do what you're doing, you tap into that. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give an example to someone yesterday and I said, you know, we're not going to have a couple of live events in a long time, but, you know, we're working on a platform where everybody is a VIP. In Nigeria, we have, you know, segments. You have VVIP, you have VIP, you have regular and things like that. But guess what? Peter could put a, 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 a concert together in his home or in his studio for an hour and guess what? People stream in or they dial in or they subscribe for a dollar or half a dollar or something. And you have, he, he's used to filling out stadiums. So yeah, you can have the same amount of people watching and experiencing this because it's something that not A, B and C are not doing the same thing. So you have the VIP experience, you can have behind the scenes where he t takes you through where he's preparing for the concert and all of that. Monetize that thing, you know. For the corporates, look at advertising on such platforms. Um, you're spending a fraction of what you would normally spend for TV or for billboards and the likes. Give it to one artist or several artists and you still get the eyeballs or the ears or the wallets that you're looking for, you know. Yeah, so oh, you... you you bring a word into this conversation that intrigues me, particularly when you couple it with creative sector, trade of services. And when we talk about mm -hmm. trade of services, we're talking about the mus musicians, people like mm -hmm. me, it was content. Um, mm -hmm. How do you build? How do you monetize? How do you know what is the standard cost? How do you um, know what to charge? How do you charge? You know, one of the problems we have in our creative sector, um, mm -hmm. basically, really not in our creative sector, in Africa worldwide, is mm -hmm. uh, the payment systems are not harmonized. So even mm -hmm. if I want to monetize, we don't have PayPal. How do people pay me, right? Our currency issues, like in Zimbabwe, how are you going to pay me if you wanted to watch this live? So tell me mm -hmm. about this money payment systems how do we actually make it practical given the problems that we actually have in Africa I mean there, there are universal ways that people um, assimilate and digest content or make payments your telco can be your bank you know you have banks that are spread across Africa those are unique points that you know you can access and collect revenue from these um, platforms and these channels so I think there are a million and one ways to do that. And perhaps it's even an opportunity for a fintech company to say, you know what, why don't we have a universal channel that is able to garner um, revenue for such and such content or for such and such businesses? I think that's something that, you know, we should all look into. But I think getting, getting the revenue would not be a problem per se. And who knows, maybe you can even partner with the likes of the Instagrams and the Facebooks. They already have such facilities um, for things like that. So that, I, I believe that that's a solution that we already probably someone is answering right now. Maybe I should take a second look at that and say, you know, maybe that this is what we should be doing in the second phase of, of the business for, for the platform that we're working at. So yeah, that would be my take. And, and this is really, really important because I, I think we, um, sometimes we can be very tech forbes, right? Mm, um, mm. I was reading just the other day that, that Mark Zuckerberg is considering bringing um, marketplace to WhatsApp, oh, yeah. Facebook, Instagram. So yeah. anyone who is on these platforms can log in and sell their commodities, you, right? You, talk, you automatically become an e-commerce business, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and th th these are 
when you look at some of our entrepreneurs, right? We are so, mm -hmm. we really talk about, we want to increase trade, we want to increase trade, we want to increase trade. Mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. spend time talking about payment systems. How do these payment systems work? And how do we work mm -hmm. to harmonize payment systems? Because truly, I can't buy from Nigeria or you can't buy from Zimbabwe without some type of harmonization mm -hmm. system. And this t t talks to me into, um, takes me to the conversation about the intra-Africa trade, right? Yeah, we one have, of my favorite topics. I know! <laughs> we have the African continental we just, trade. We just got on that train last year. When did you guys sign this? Did you, did you actually sign the, the agreement? Yeah, have we, you we, got, we, we, we have. We got on the train. We got on the train last year. Ooh, Apparently, ooh, it was a big deal that Nigeria hadn't signed. What? You, you, know, to... you know, we had to, we had to make sure. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you the reasons why that happened, right? Um, of course, with the WTO um, and their, um, what's it called? There was a lot of skepticism with um, dispute settlement when it comes to the WTO because a lot of developing companies uh, countries had the short end of the stick. So we had to make sure that whatever right. we were going into wasn't similar to what we were coming from. So Nigeria's concern was whether it was the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria or even you know down to the labor union to make sure that everybody was well taken care of and considered when going into this agreement. So those were the things that kind of slowed us down from signing initially. Um, but now that, you know, the, um, the AU with the African Development Bank and FREXM have made sure that all of these concerns were well taken care of. And the fact that, you know, last year was a very volatile year with a lot of um, xenophobia and all of that. You didn't want a hostile market environment if we were to go into all of that. So ensure that your citizenry weren't going to get any kind of backlash from that. Or if we yeah. decide to bring our products into the market, you know, there won't be some sort of sanction or it wouldn't be ignored or abandoned. So those are the things that we had to look at. This Never. is the best time to trade intra-Africa. I mean, I, I feel for anyone who's trading in, whether it's a product or a service, what, that, what this intra-trade agreement has done or will do for your business or for you is the fact that it opens you, it expands the market for your goods and your. So if you were catering to a market of a hundred people, you expand that a bit and you have, you know, a thousand or 10,000. Um, right. I, I think money doesn't see the color or the, the boundaries that are the geographical boundaries. Money is right. money. And I, I think that Africa is poised in the position to be able to, um, take advantage of this situation. Why, why can't I get my cotton from, from Egypt and manufacture it in, in Zimbabwe or Kenya or Nigeria and sell it to all of Africa? We have to be able to see that we do need each and every one of us here. It would also help in boosting the economic growth of each country that is within you know, the continent and within the AU. Um, I believe that in terms of the dispute settlement, Nobody gets, um, there's no unfair advantage to anyone for providing protection or it provides protection from a hostile environment, like I had said uh, before. And then there's equal access amongst member states. So you're all going in there knowing that this is the service that I'm offering. And you know that your product or your service has to be quality because this is a whole new bargain, it's a whole new market, and things have to be done properly. I believe it also puts Africa in the best position to create a strong market in these uncertain times. So I'm all for inter-trade as long as the policies make sense and they are fair to all member states and all parties concerned. I believe there's a lot going on in Africa that needs to be harnessed and exploited. I believe that there is so much we have to offer, not just each other, but the world and the time is now. Hmm. And you know what? I could not have said it any better. And I think if, if I say it, people think I've lost my mind because I, 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 I live, breathe, and talk intra-Africa trade. I talk about capacity building from trading with... Yeah. I don't see how we can sustainably uh, empower people, empower communities without mm -hmm. increasing 
their capacity to trade. I of am course. really sold and really um, not not sold on money for free, right? Um, I, I just don't feel like people should be given free money. There's nothing like a free lunch. It always comes with some type mm -hmm. of this, this, that. Yeah, there's absolutely like nothing like that. There's so when you like think about intra-Africa trade, right? Right now, yeah. the world is closed mm -hmm. off. It's going to mm -hmm. be closed off for a while. We are not receiving mm -hmm. much. We're not getting anything from anywhere. What does that tell us? Straight up. I mean, it tells us, this is, I, I, I'll take a cue from, from a very good friend of mine, T.Y. Yeah. T.Y. Bello. She says the land is green. Again, there's no such time as this to be able to take up these opportunities. I think now we're beginning to pay more attention to the fact that Africa is capable of being self-sustainable or self-sustaining. There's nothing whispers, there's nothing happening out there that we can't do here. Of, I mean, Aldo said it here, Aldo Mekori, I'm sure you know who Aldo is and he's one of the greatest minds on the continent and a very good friend of mine. He says strategic collaboration. Once the vision is won, once we all agree that this is to move Africa forward, this is to move businesses, this is to create more job opportunities, this is to create employment, this is so that we have a better health sector and we are all aligned to the same vision. I don't think there's anything that we cannot achieve as African entrepreneurs, African business people. We have even the, the, the technology, which has been the biggest disruptor of, of, of businesses in the last decade and a half. It aligns. Yeah. You have great yeah. fintech companies in Africa. You have great healthcare, you know, um, technology companies in Africa doing great things. Who would have thought in a million years, and I'm not taking it away from them in any way, that Senegal yeah. would be able to find a, the test for, 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 for COVID that would cost a dollar. A dollar. A dollar. If we just apply ourselves, if we put our minds to it, I don't think there's anything that we cannot achieve as Africans. Again, this is the right time. There are so many opportunities coming up in the marketplace. This is the yeah. time for us to sit together and say, listen, how can we make these areas better? I come from a country where we haven't even tapped or scratched the surface for the potential that Nigeria has, whether it's oil. Forget oil right now. The yeah. next largest export that, that Nigeria has had is our creative industries, whether it's music or film or our TV series. I'm, I'm, I mean, yeah. Congo, people are watching, you know, Nollywood, you know, down to the fashion. The, the Kente cloth is what's been, what's trending, or Ankara, as we call it, you know, wax uh, material. That's what's trending in the Western world now. Please, we had this way, way, way back. And this is the time for us to wear our crowns properly and get to work. Nothing is going to be handed over to you. Africa is not made up of third world countries. If we all yeah. do what we ought to do, believe me, the sky is beyond the limit for us. The sky is just the springboard for us. So in, in your sense, and, and I, I completely agree, I could not, I could not agree anymore. Um, the time is now. I've always believed that we have everything we need, right? When mm -hmm. I watch, whether I'm watching pieces of work, whether it's Burner Boy on stage, burning up the stage, whether it's, um, it's uh, Black Coffee from South Africa, whether it's Japraza from Zimbabwe, it doesn't matter where I am. It just feels as though we're sitting on this gold mine and we constantly feel like we need to check we need to look back like, uh, who's coming? Oh, exactly. I just don't understand that. I really, it's, it's, I struggle to reconcile it that who are you waiting for? Like, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Us. There is no one else who's coming. How do you, how do you, how do you shape a joint vision? Because I think that's, that's, um, that's a problem that I, I think when we're talking about cultural intelligence, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think Cultural intelligence is a very important principle in the world mm -hmm. that we exist in because the world we exist in needs strategic collaboration. Strategic collaboration yeah. means I, I in Chenisai in Zimbabwe can collaborate mm -hmm. with MM in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. different between me and MM is our culture and understanding uh, an understanding of 
how um, a mem is socialized and how Chinese is socialized allows mm -hmm. us to come to the table and immediately be able to respect each other's turf, to find Absolutely. common ground and work mm -hmm. if so it's not about tra it's 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 not about overlooking someone's culture it's not about undermining someone's culture it's about finding mm -hmm. the understanding and the respect and then building mm -hmm. the bridge that's what cultural intelligence is in in a nutshell mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we think about how do we work in building these bridges how, how, how do you do it i mean you you represent a lot of people you you mm -hmm. monetize a lot of what they do how hard mm -hmm. is it to monetize and how hard is it to form collaborations across different se sectors and different genres i think the, the, I, i've worked from the answer to the question um the one thing that i have found is that if we do not have common ground it's going to be very hard for us to come together and collaborate mm -hmm. So if we do not have common interests, there's no reason why we'll be having a conversation anyways. People will do what they want to do for self. We talk about Ubuntu. We, we know that one of the pivotal things that um, anchors in Africa is a sense of community, family. If we fail to see those things, there's no way, you know, I would, I would look and say, China style, oh, we don't have anything in common. You're all the way in Zimbabwe. I'm all the way in Nigeria. Do your thing out of mind. But when we yeah. have goal and purpose, it's easier to collaborate. Those are the strategic partnerships and collaborations that, you know, we keep talking about, um, whether it's for your business and the way you push, whether it's policies and you say, oh, there has to be one Africa, there has to be something where everybody is benefiting from. If those are not on, if that's not on the table, there's no point having a conversation. So first and foremost is to find common ground. Um, we all believe in community. We all come from families. Our culture also extols, you know, the, the, the importance of family, the importance of community. Once we can align and see each other as that, not as competition, not as, oh, the enemy, I think it, it, would, it would make more sense for us to come together and say, we have to do better. We have to come together to make things happen. And we have the numbers. We, 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 we know that that is a need that we have in this part of the world and you know that that's what i would say or that's how i would put it that we do need to find something that binds us together do we want to be better do we want to be more successful together how can i help you how can you help me how can we do this you know together and all of that common purpose i mean what what is the average i, I can't speak for all africans but i do yeah. know that um, you know one of the things that each, every African wants is to be able to stand on their own two feet, mm -hmm. be able mm -hmm. to, you know, provide for family, provide for their community, make sure that they have great, good health, um, have a job that pays well. And that's, that's the thing right there. Um, the, mm -hmm. the idea of you define the common purpose. When I asked you what defines a common purpose, how do we know what the common purpose is? Guys, it's not rocket science. Everyone wants to feed their children. Everyone wants to take care of their parents. Everyone wants to take care of themselves. So when you think about a common purpose for someone, if you want to work with someone, what are you bringing to the table? What are they bringing to the table? Are you paying them well enough a living wage, right? A wage that allows them to take care of their family. That's just it right? We can work together, but we can't work together if we take advantage of each other. And this talks about the issues you're talking about, standardization. How do we standardize so that I know if I am giving you a service, you pay me $10 and it's not $5, it's not $3 because you're taking advantage of me. How do we build those standards, Amir? We, we need to define our own standards and hold each other by those standards you why know? do we not mm -hmm. pay creators what they deserve what is that about i think you know a lot of people see you see that's that's a that's um a concern or that's a, a disadvantage of providing intangible services or providing 
intangible assets. It's not a house that is being built. It's not um, crops that are being cultivated. So they can't see. So like, why, why would I pay you so much to make me a beautiful dress? Is it after all, it's just a dress, right? Or you're just singing music, just get on the stage, sing and leave. Or, or you're just an actor, just act and get on with it. You'll go to... You see, those are one of the things and the reasons why we got into this business because you have to respect the creator. I don't care how you want to see it. I think creatives are next to... They, they, they have, there's there's a, a lot of God in them because you do not know what we go through to create these things that you so easily discard or enjoy and then discard it, it, it doesn't work that way again it, it, it's the it, same it, thing we were talking does, about and then it yeah. doesn't make any sense we're sitting here you know mm -hmm. for me to have a website for me to have mm -hmm. a website for me to have good graphics for me to have good writing um i'm talking about my value chain at chinasai africa graphics good website mm -hmm. um good writer uh, people to collaborate with when I want uh, ideation, think tanks. Where do you think mm -hmm. these people, you think these people are mm -hmm. doing it for free? This COVID mm -hmm. for me allowed me to say, I have to remember why I started, right? Mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. to build systems and processes so that small scale creatives can build robust businesses, build robust Absolutely. businesses that they can bring home to their children so that their children can mm -hmm. carry these brands, right? Preach, um, preach. No, 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 I did not start this snare so that I can walk into mm -hmm. a room and someone tells me, no, 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 you know, um, you're charging too much. I'm like, hold up. How much are you being paid? You're being paid a salary to sit there mm -hmm. and tell me I'm charging tell too me much. Nonsense. Uh, wait, exactly. Like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, do I need to hang my qualifications and my experience? Mm -hmm. On my neck. Uh, yeah. Uh, for you to respect that I'm bringing value, there. But you see, again, again, because, this is because. why this is why they need the likes of us in the creative yeah. business, in the creative industries. Twenty years ago in Nigeria, nobody gave anyone who was either an actor, or a footballer, or an artist or a producer. Yeah. They assumed that you didn't do well in school. So instead of being a layabout, the closest thing yeah. to being a layabout would be to do, you know, these jobs. All of that has changed now. You know, Nigerian artists are one of the best or well-paid um, talents in Africa or in the world. Right. Because we show you how we, we, we tabulate these intangibles that you so easily, you know, um, resent or you don't give a, a, a I'm not going to use such words on air, but you, you, you <laughs> have no value for. I heard and it. You're, you're, <laughs> No, but you know, and you're, 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 you're the first person. You're, they are the first people to use your music without your permission for their right. ads. Do mm. you just invite people that you don't want to work with mm -hmm. to have a discussion? Mm. I mean, that's that's the most you you hit the nail on the head. What is the value that you are bringing to the table? So for me to be sitting on that table, it means that you won't recognize whatever I place on that value that I am bringing is what you must accept. What? I mean, I spent six, seven years in the creative sector, all right? Building value, mm -hmm. learning systems, learning processes, collaborating. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? I, I think we, 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 over here, we kind of learn the hard, hard way. When one or two people get into trouble once or twice, people sit up. Ah. You know? when, ah. when your ads are done with our music, maybe then you pay more attention and it's bland right. and you don't have customers, you know, coming through your doors. You, you might pay attention. When there's no music on the mm. airwaves for a whole day, I'm not even going to talk about a week, maybe then you would begin to appreciate it. What is your hope for Africa? My hope for Africa is to see an Africa that can stand on her own two feet. See an Africa that I can be proud to leave kids and say, yes, I, I left this continent better that, than I found it. So I believe that, again, just wrapping up on everything that we have said, do we have what it takes to be that great continent and be the motherland? It just takes a few like minds, and other people that I know, you know, who are constantly and every day pushing to ensure that Africa is one to make it happen. So my hope is that we all awaken to these possibilities yeah. and also bring it to reality.
feet. She wants to see an Africa that stands on its own feet. The question and the very fundamental question is, how are we going to do it? And she says, we need to collaborate. How do you collaborate? We got to keep working, guys. So from me to you, let's think about how we build value. Thank you so much, MM. It was amazing. And thank you for joining us. Bye, guys.